I want to start this morning by saying a happy Sabbath to each and every one. It is truly a pleasure that God can create the required technology for circumstances like those in which the world finds itself in today, where we are not able to gather as easily as we would like to. However, we are still blessed with being able to fellowship together through uh, the mechanisms of technological discoveries that God has made available to man. I want to do a subject this morning which I consider to be very important. Uh, the subject uh, stems from many different presentations that I have seen made in recent times concerning people being encouraged to flee. Flee because the Sunday law is coming. Flee to the mountains. Flee out of the cities. Just get somewhere where it is nice and solitary and secluded because the judgments of God are coming and uh, the judgments of men are coming even more speedily. Well, uh, the subject I'm going to deal with really addresses whether or not now is the time for us to flee to the mountains. Whether or not the Lord is telling everyone at this point that we've got to get out of all the cities, big or small, doesn't matter, just get somewhere and be in a position where you can be safe because everything is going to be coming down on us, including Jacob's time of trouble. And it is promoted by most people as being something that is entirely and really imminent, as though it is, it's going to happen in the next few days or weeks. So we've got to move right now. So I believe it is essential for the people of God to always be in harmony with God's program, God's plans. So I've entitled it, as I said before, When to Flee. When to Flee. I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21, as we consider the subject of uh, When to Flee. Luke chapter 21, and we're going to look at uh, verse 20 to 22. Luke chapter 21. The picture that I have on the screen dealing with the title is one of the occasions in modern time when families and friends had to flee because of war, because of crisis that they were facing in their own country. And many of them had to flee uh, in the mountains and the hills and to uh, cross borders into other countries. I believe this particular one was an incident involving the Syrians. But hear what the Bible speaks of and what Jesus had prophesied in his time that the saints would have had to encounter. And again, Luke 21, verse 20 to 22. Jesus declares, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So Jesus was here disclosing to the disciples that there would be a necessity for them to flee. And that this fleeing was for their own good. If they stayed where they were, they would have been persecuted or killed. What is important is that Jesus was showing the disciples that he cared for them and he knew the future 
And he wanted them to be aware of it because he would not have been physically around at the time when this situation would have arisen. And we know that what he had declared did fulfill some years after he had left the earth to return back to his father. In the year AD 70, when the Roman army came against Jerusalem, it was actually the fulfillment of this prophecy that Jerusalem would have been surrounded or besieged by enemies. And we understand from history that many, many lives were lost as a result of that incident. But we are also given full assurance that those who obeyed Christ's instructions and fled at the time that he said to flee, none of them died. None of them died. I want to share a statement, or I should say a quotation from the book Great Controversy with you. It is found in Great Controversy, page 30, and I'm going to read paragraph 2. Great Controversy, page 30, and we will look at paragraph 2. Inspiration declared. Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. How many Christians perished? Inspiration tells us not one Christian perished. Not one, brothers and sisters. That means every single true Christian escaped what was taking place in Jerusalem. Every single Christian was able to escape what had come upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Insp inspiration continues. Not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Christ had given his disciples warning. And all who believed his words watched for the promised sign. They watched for what? The promised sign. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, said Jesus, then know that the destruction thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Luke 21, 20, 21. After the Romans under Cestius had surrounded the city, they unexpectedly abandoned the siege when everything seemed favorable for an immediate attack. The besieged despairing of successful resistance were on the point of surrender when the Roman general withdrew his forces without the least apparent reason. But God's merciful providence was directing events for the good of his people. So we, for, we understand that the army surrounded the city and all of a sudden under Cestius there was a decision to back away and leave. And uh, it was unexpected because everyone in the city, all the Jews in the city, were expecting that they would have been kept uh, under the control of the army and then eventually the army would have moved in and began to destroy the people and the city itself. But that is not what happened. Under Cestius, he came, they surrounded the city, and then he just decided to leave because there was some uh, history shows that there was uh, certain uh, news that required him to leave immediately. But that was all planned by God. God made it possible for the um, general at that point to have to abandon his original plan and just leave. The re reference continues to reveal some more facts to us concerning what had taken place. Note, the promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians, and now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. What was that promised sign? The city was surrounded 
and there were certain other details that I'm going to show you led the Christians to know that it was time for them to leave. Note, inspiration continues. The promised sign had been given to the waiting Christians and now an opportunity was offered for all who would to obey the Savior's warning. Events were so overruled that neither Jews nor Romans should hinder the flight of the Christians. So the Lord overruled circumstances in such a way that whether you were a Jew or you were a pagan, you would not have in any way interfered with the Christians being able to get away. God had designed it that his people will not be hindered or stopped. Note, upon the retreat of Cestius, the Jews sallying from Jerusalem pursued after his retiring army. And while both forces were thus fully engaged, the Christians had an opportunity to leave the city. At this time, the country also had been cleared of enemies who might have endeavored to intercept them. So even the Lord had, in, had taken care of the enemies of the Jews, that any enemies that were in the city, he made them also go out of the way so that they would not block the Christians when it was time for them to leave. Note, at the time of the siege, the Jews were assembled at Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And thus the Christians throughout the land were able to make their escape unmolested. Without delay, they fled to a place of, of safety, the city of Pella in the land of Perea beyond Jordan. So God had provided all the right circumstances for his people to get away from the city at the time when the Romans had left or retreated and decided to leave the scene of their besieging of the city of Jerusalem. The, 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 all the Christians were able to recognize the sign that Jesus was referring to and they fled. They fled to an, a place, a city called Pella. I'll just show you a picture of Pella. This was a picture that my wife and I had taken when we went to the Middle East with uh, Ron Wyatt in the year 1998. He was, uh, we were fortunate to also go to Jordan and we were shown the area of Pella where the city originally was. This is a this is a, a, a excavated um, buildings that were in the city of Pella. As I said, it was a whole city, and this was part of it. And if you observe in the picture, it was surrounded by mountains. So the Lord made sure that uh, His people were very much secured. But this was. A, a, a ways away from Jerusalem itself. So no one was expecting them to leave and no one was aware of the time when they left. Now that is something for you and I to consider because we know that according to the spirit of prophecy that what we read in Luke 21 is going to be fulfilled again in these last days. God's people are going to have to flee when they see a sign, a particular sign. We will have to leave. A sign that Jesus has already revealed to us. When we see it, we will need to flee. And there must be no delay. As we saw in the, in the previous reference, um, that they could not delay at all. They had to make sure and leave immediately or else they would have found themselves in serious problems. Notice, without delay, they fled to a place of safety, the city of Pella, in the land of Perea, beyond Jordan. Um, sometime in the near future, we will share some more information in regards to some of the discoveries of Ron Wyatt because the Lord did use him to be able to unravel a number of different uh, religious sites that are of great importance to those who are Bible students today. Well, I want to go a step further. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 24. 
because the same situation of the past, AD 70, and the end time uh, experience that we are going to also have was um, prophesied also in Matthew chapter 24. And we will look at verse 15 and 16. Matthew chapter 24. And we'll look at verse 15 and 16. Jesus again declared in the words this time of Matthew. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso read it, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now this is the scripture that most people make reference to today which has to do with the abomination of desolation and the fact that Jesus' instruction was to flee to the mountains just as the Christians did when they fled to the city of Pella in the mountains a little distance away from uh, Jerusalem. The, the fact that God had provided a place, a solitary place where the saints could have been secure gives us hope because we know that the Lord will also provide solitary places for those who are going to have to flee in these last days when the appointed time shall come. And Ellen White speaking about it and revealing to us what really was the sign that the Christians were looking for. I think it's amazing how much we have in the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy. This is the, from the book Great Controversy, page 25. And we're looking at paragraph 4. Great Controversy, page 25 and paragraph 4. And note what we are told. Unmistakable signs will precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly. Just as inspiration tells us the final movements will be rapid ones. It will be so again. And the Savior warned his followers. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Who so read it let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Matthew 24, 15, 16 and making reference also to Luke 21, 20, 20, 20 and 21 that we just read earlier. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, those who would escape, must make no delay. Brothers and sisters, observe what Ellen White revealed to us was indeed the abomination of desolation in that day. It, the question has to be asked. According to uh, all the different things that we are hearing and have heard over the years from others, what really was the abomination of desolation? Was it the Roman army itself? Or was it the idolatrous standards that they had planted in the ground when they began to surround the city? Now, what really are the standards? The standards that the Romans used to use were their flags or their banners or their insignias or those different uh, uh, emblems that they may have utilized in times past to represent the different legions, Roman uh, military groups that were sent out from time to time to carry out different military missions. The, each legion had its own insignia, its own standards, or its own banners. And these banners were their sign or their mark of who it is they were. And they even at times had symbols or emblems of the gods that they worshipped. 
So could you imagine a Jew seeing these idolatrous standards planted on holy ground? <laughs> it wasn't just the Romans, it wasn't just the people, but the fact that each of those standards may have had an idol printed on it, an emblem of some false god that they had honored being planted on holy ground, it was, according to Ellen White, viewed as an abomination in the eyes of the Jewish people. So, how is this going to be applied today? What is the sign that the Romans will use today? Is it just the Romans that, that represent the abomination? Or is it the mark, their personal mark, that was originated by Satan as a symbol of him being their God? Note what we are told in, uh, as we have read in this reference. Ellen White in, uh, clearly states, and I, I go back to Great Controversy 25 and paragraph 4. When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground. When what? The idolatrous standards of the Romans. When that was set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. So they were not supposed to flee just because they saw the Romans. But once the Romans put down their standards, because once they put down those standards, they are saying, we are here to occupy your city. And that means we are here in the name of our gods. These gods was an abomination to come and be set up on holy ground because they were all basically idols. That is what the Christians had to look for. A mark that was representing a false god. And once they saw that mark, they fled. And as we read earlier on, the servant of the Lord told us, not one Christian who took heed to the warning of Christ perished. Not one. All of them. Every single true Christian escaped. I want to share another reference. This time it's found in volume 5 of the Spirit of Prophecy, reading from page 464 and paragraph 3. Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, page 464 and paragraph 3. We read as follows. It is no time now for God's people to be fixing their affections or laying up their treasure in the world. The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for the retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. And now instead of seeking expensive dwellings here, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even a heavenly Instead of spending our means in self-gratification, we should be studying to economize. Every talent lent of God should be used to His glory in giving the warning to the world. God has a work for His co-laborers to do in the cities. Our mission must be sustained. New missions must be opened. To carry forward this work successfully will require no small outlay. Houses of worship are needed where the people may be invited to hear the truths for this time. 
For this very purpose, God has entrusted the capital to his stewards. Let not your property be tied up in worldly enterprises, so that this work shall be hindered. Get your means where you can handle it for the benefit of the cause of God. Send your treasures before you into heaven. I'm going to come back to that part of the reference, but let's first of all consider what we were told in the first part of the same reference. Inspiration is now showing us what is the mark or the sign that God's people have to look for in these last days. We already saw that the mark or the sign or insignia were the idolatrous standards or banners of the Roman soldiers. The fact that they came and surrounded the city was step number one. That was the beginning of the warning. But once they laid down those standards in the ground, it showed that they came to plant their God <laughs> on holy ground or in Jerusalem where God's people were residing. Now I'm sure that prior to that event, Romans came and, and left. They came and moved around because, remember, the, the, the Jews were under the Roman rule. So they saw Roman legions from time to time, especially when you had certain uprisings, when certain um, Jews who ended up fighting against the Romans uh, had to be beaten down. Roman legions moved in. They came in. But... They did not necessarily plant their standards in Jerusalem on those occasions. But on this occasion, they did. They made sure that the Jews got the message that they were taking control and bringing in their false gods for them to be subjected to. And that was the sign. Inspiration is now revealing to us what is our sign in these last days? And it's not a whole lot different. The assumption of power on the part of our nation. So here in the United States, there will be an assumption of power. And when you use the word assumption, you're talking about uh, taking over something or beginning something. Taking, uh, 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 having a start or beginning to take uh, to put something into operation, assuming something. When the United States government begins by introducing the decree enforcing the people's Sabbath, that will be our warning. And it is not until we see the Sunday law enforced in our nation, enforced. It is urged, and in the process of its being urged, then there's going to be legislating of the law, and then it will be enforced initially with uh, fines and then imprisonment. This, once we get those signs, once we see uh, that the Sunday law is being not just urged or promoted, but it is being planted into the nation through legislation as well as through uh, their uh, putting certain um, penalties attached to it that those who disobey, they are going to be fined a certain amount of money or they are going to be imprisoned for a certain amount of time. Once we see that is introduced here in the United States, then we know it is the sign that Jesus is telling us we need to look for because basically what we are looking at is the mark of the beast. The, the Roman mark anciently or in AD 70 was the mark that, that was uh, shown on the standards. But now we are going to have the mark in the form of the papal Sabbath being promoted here and established here in the United States with certain, uh, certain penalties or, 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 or fines as, and, as, and, and imprisonment, as Ellen White said, it would be initially before, and this is even before 
it be, there is a debt decree attached to it. We are not going to wait until the debt decree is attached to it before we begin to understand that we need to start making movements. But Ellen White tells us what movements we need to make when it is initially enforced through fines and imprisonment. Notice what she says here. It will then be time to leave what? The large cities. Preparatory to leave in the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. So it's a two-step move that we will have to make. It starts with us as we see the sign, as we see they are enforcing the Sunday law after urging it, urging it upon the inhabitants of the United States for a period of time because it may not necessarily go down easy with everyone. And that's when it will become something that they will demand when they see some resistance. Um, but that is only the beginning the first phase of the enforcement. And when we see that first phase, inspiration says we have to move out of the large cities. Those who are still there. Because not everyone is going to wait until they see the sign to start to move. God is not expecting us to do that. And I'm going to show you in a little while uh, where the spirit of prophecy shows that we needed to have started doing that a long time ago. But... In general, those who are still, those Christians that is, those Seventh-day Adventist Christians, or those who accept the true Sabbath, uh, when we see the first phase, that's the sign for us. If we are still in any of the large cities, we need to leave them and go, according to Ellen White, to smaller ones to prepare for when it is time to go to the mountains. So we don't go to the mountains right away when the Sunday law is initially enforced. We don't run to the mountains right away. So these people who are telling us we have to start fleeing just because they're seeing more government control taking place in this land. That's not what inspiration is telling us. Uh, it's, the, it's supposed to be our, our steps. We are supposed to be moving out of the large cities first. That's the first step. After seeing the signs, those who are still there need to move. They cannot delay anymore. And they need to move to the smaller cities in preparation for when the Lord says it is time for us to move to the mountains. Now the last part of that same reference, notice Ellen White is emphasizing our not putting all our focus on material things at this time. Why? Why? Because brothers and sisters, we have a work to do. When we get the sign and we leave the large cities and we move to the smaller cities, it is because we have to use that location that is further away from the large cities to start doing a work of giving the message in a loud cry. So between our moving from the large cities to our moving to the smaller cities and then moving on to the mountains, before we could move on to the mountains, while we are in the smaller cities, we have to give the loud cry. Ellen White tells us that every talent lent of God should be used to his glory in giving the warning to the world. God has a work for his collaborators to do in the cities. But we are not to do that work from the large cities. We have to do it from the smaller cities. And that's why many of God's people have already started to move out of the large cities because they know what to expect. And that it is in that particular location the smaller cities that we are being told we are going to have to carry out a major work. And Ellen White gives us an idea of the major work. She's showing us that houses of worship are needed, where the people may be invited to hear the truths for this time. We, we, we have a lot of work to do during the time of the loud cry. How long? 
we're going to be crying out loud for? We don't know. The Lord is going to give us directions as we go forward. But what we do know is that at that time, all that the saints have will be used to advance the truth before it is time for us to make the final fleeing into the mountains. So, even though we have already seen that this is what happened to God's people in the time of the Jews in AD 70, it is important for us to also take into consideration what inspiration says, that at the time that the U.S. government assumes or takes on or starts uh, the, the decree enforcing the Sunday law, um, we need to realize that uh, the fleeing is in two phases or two parts. One from the cities, the large cities, and then eventually from the smaller ones, and from the smaller ones into the mountains. So there are a few things I want us to identify here. If you recall this end time events chart that was used uh, recently, I'm going to have it put in the, um, the chat area so that anyone who wants to download a copy of the chart uh, because we need to become acquainted with uh, how we see everything fitting into prophecy so that we can follow through and not be misled by those who may be alarmists and trying to cause us to make uh, movements prematurely. We need to do it in God's time because if, if everybody decides to flee to the mountains now, who is going to be around to give the loud cry? How are we going to be able to do it? Most of the people on the planet Earth don't know anything about the three angels' messages. That's why God is going to give us the power, as Inspiration said in early writings 33, at the commencement of the time of trouble. So while the, the urging, the urging of the mark of the beast is being made, we have to begin to recognize it is time for us to move from the large cities into the smaller ones because God is ready to use us to do what? To give the loud cry. We need to see the sign and begin to flee in its first phase. Fleeing because why? We know that the worst is yet to come. But we are given the assurance, and we saw this in the two previous presentations that I had done within the last couple months, one dealing with uh, Jacob's uh, time of trouble as well as the anger of the nations. In both of these presentations, it was clear that at the time when the urging takes place, when the mark of the beast becomes a major item here in the United States, God is going to pour out His Spirit upon those who were preparing for it. And He's going to send them to proclaim the loud cry. So yes, we are going to first receive the latter rain. Once we see the trouble is beginning, we need to find ourselves like the early disciples, seeking the Lord earnestly for the outpouring. But we can't wait until... We see the urging. We are living in a time when the enemy is doing everything to, to push the Sunday law. Using the environment, using the, 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 the different um, possibly uh, viruses and everything else to be able to let people see we need to rest. And we need to have the earth resting. But the end result will be the promoting and the enforcing of a Sunday law. God is going to give his people the latter in of power. They are going to go forth and proclaim the loud cry. And notice on the chart we have the abomination of desolation here. And that is the final manifestation of the abomination of desolation in the form of the mark of the beast attaching to it a death decree. That's when God's people have to flee to the mountains. 
We don't flee to the mountains when the mark of the beast is being urged or when it is initially legislated and enforced with fines and imprisonment. It is when it is promoted in the form of a debt decree. That is when we have finished our work and it's time to flee to the mountains and to solitary places in the munitions of rocks according to the Bible in order to escape the tyranny that will be issued against the saints who keep the seven day Sabbath. That's when Michael will stand up to deliver all those who have been faithful in keeping the Sabbath, the true Sabbath holy, and facing the hardships that we will face during that whole stretch of time before Jacob's trouble begins. Brothers and sisters, we have a work to do now because we are living in the time leading up to the urging, the urging of the mark of the beast. All the stuff that we are going through today is to prepare us to eventually hear a call for keeping Sunday holy here in the United States as a requirement that will eventually be legislated and enforced. But we are not to be discouraged because God has a plan in place and he needs us to be preparing to represent him in carrying forward his plan. Let us go to another statement here. This one is taken from Last Day Events, Last Day Events, page 95 and paragraph 2. Last Day Events, page 95 and paragraph 2. Ellen White says, Out of the cities is my message at this time. This is talking about from her time. Ellen White from way back was telling Seventh-day Adventists we need to get out of the cities. Now we understand from looking at the other references that she's talking about leaving the large cities to go to the smaller ones preparatory or in preparation for our eventually having to flee to the mountains. But way back when she was telling us we need to start leaving those large cities. Out of the cities is my message at this time. Be assured that the call is for our people to locate miles away from large cities. One look at San Francisco as it is today would speak to your intelligent minds, showing you the necessity of getting out of the cities. Brethren, there's a a very interesting analogy, or I, I should say example, that Ellen White has often used in her writings for us to understand why it is God needs us to move out of the large cities and, and go into the countryside or where small cities are. She has often spoken about the experience of Enoch. And she tells us that we are going to have to do a work similar to Enoch. What Enoch did, he did not live in the large cities. He lived in the countryside. That's the areas where you will have small cities, where you don't have a cluster, a large amount of people and hustling and bustling and entertainment, etc. He did that in order to carry out his work, the work that God had placed upon him. He would work between the country or the mountain areas or the areas where he lived at that time because it was more mountainous uh, even in those small locations where people may have dwelt than it is here today. But he worked between the large cities where the, the, the majority of the people were and where he lived in the country area. We have to do the same thing. When we move to the smaller cities, we need to find some little place where we would be able to still maybe have the opportunity for growing some food, if possible. 
where we would be able to be free from all the hustle and bustle of worldliness and the lights and the distractions that usually you will find in the large cities. In the smaller ones you will find those too, but not, on the, not at the scale, not to the extent that you will generally find it in the larger cities. And thus we would be able to still have access to the things we would need as opposed to our going up into the mountains and not having access to the people in the cities or in the villages round about. We still need to go and proclaim the message in the large cities. That's the reason why God will be giving us the appointing of the Spirit in the form of the latter rain because we still have a work to do. And instead of us doing it far up in the mountains, we live up in the mountains and now we have to travel for days in some, on some occasions to be able to get to the large cities to be able to do the work. No, that's not how it was for Enoch and that's not how it is going to be for us. We need to move when we see the sign, when we see the mark. The mark today is a little different. Similar to the mark in AD 70 because both of them, both the, the Sunday law as well as the idolatrous uh, standards of the Romans, they both were emblems or signs that were received by the enemy. And once we see the sign that God has told us we will see today, we need to make sure that we are living in a country area or in a small city area. Otherwise, brothers and sisters, why would he give us the power if we are not going to be in a position to quickly use it, to run, go, travel back and forth quickly between our homes and the cities to give the message with a loud cry. So if God is going to make it convenient for us to be able to do our work as quickly as possible so that the end can finally come. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. And look at verse 15 through 17. Isaiah 33 verses 15 through 17. He that walketh righteously and speak it uprightly. He that despiseth the gain of oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be diminutions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his waters shall be sure. Then I shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Yes, brothers and sisters, uh, this scripture, uh, these verses, are really describing those who will be living in the last days that are truly faithful. Living in the small cities, far away from the large ones, far away, as according to Ellen White, from the large ones. They are the ones that will not be easily bribed to give up their faith because they will not be bombarded by the distractions of this world. They are the ones that will be stopping their ears from hearing all the nonsense that you usually are exposed to in large city areas. All distractions, basically. And those, they will be the ones that will be shutting their eyes from seeing evil around them every day. Every day. Once they step out of their homes. That's what it's like in those large cities. And God wants to save us from that. And he wants to save us in advance of the time of the mark of the beast so that we would be ready. We would be acclimatized to living in a country setting in 
comparison to maybe the city areas that we may have lived for a greater part of our lives. You know, people have to get accustomed to such a change. Moving from the city to the country can take its toll on some people. I've seen people who've had to run back to try and regain their sanity because they were not even mentally and emotionally prepared for the move. God has given us opportunity to get ready because we need to be pretty much settled into that simple way of living before we have to travel back and forth to give the message of the loud cry. You see, being away from the city and living in the country helps us to have more opportunity to commune with God and bring our lives into alignment with His life so that when we are filled with the Spirit of God, we are going to be well prepared. We'll be ready for it and we'll be able to focus on the job at hand, which is to give the final message to those who are the inhabitants of the earth. But it has to be done in God's way. And then we have the promise in verse 16, if we do that, if we, dis if we stay away from the distractions of this world by making the right move at God's directions, uh, he tells us that our bread and water will be sure. So when we have completed our work of proclaiming the loud cry and the faithful are sealed, we are told then it is that we will have to dwell in high places it's, and, and, and our defense will be the munitions of rocks because we will be then moving to the mountains because of the death decree that it's going to be attached to the Sunday law. So the Sunday law is going to be in both two phases, just as our move is going to be in two phases. Phase one is going to be uh, with the enforcing of the law with fines and imprisonment. And phase two, phase two will be when they attach the debt decree to it. Our two phases of movement will be when we see the first sign of the Sunday law with the enforcement attached to it, then we have to make sure we are out completely from the large cities because God wants to take us where we will be able to prepare for the outpouring of the latter rain upon us. May God help us to, to understand these things. The, this, it is important that we understand it so that we can while we still have time, start to get ourselves mentally and emotionally prepared for these changes. And as we find ourselves more in a quiet, simple place and lifestyle, we would be at the same time going through that upper room experience like the disciples did where we would be more prepared to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's going to be very difficult for us to be really prepared for it if we are still living in large cities, brothers and sisters. It will be very difficult. Because you see, when you, when you move to the smaller cities, you can live on the outskirts. You don't even have to live right in the heart of those small cities. You can go into the country areas, in, 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 in areas that are uh, the, the regions round about uh, where you can still have access to the cities so that you can communicate with the people and get the things that you need. Uh, but at the same time, you would have more freedom and access to uh, a, a simple, solitary life of being able to commune and spend more time with God like Enoch did. Uh, that we will need, just as the disciples had that coming aside upper room experience that we are going to need before we are able to receive the latter reign of power. I want to remind us of something before uh, I wrap up the message. And that is, uh, remember what had happened in the time of Lot. When it was time for Lot to flee also, he nor his family were ready for the move. Not even Lot. 
uh, if you go back and you read in Genesis 19, you'll see that the angel didn't only have to take a hold of Lot's daughters. He had to take a hold of Lot himself. But, you know, let, let, let's, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to Genesis 19. I'm going to try and get through this quickly. Genesis chapter 19. And look at verse 14 through 16. Genesis 19 verses 14 through 16. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. In other words, his sons-in-law were not true believers. Unfortunately, the, the, his daughters were not married to the right men. They were not prepared to make any move. Note verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, make, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here. And notice, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And verse 16, And while he lingered, while who lingered? Lot! He lingered, dragging his feet. The men laid hold on his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful unto him and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So even Lot nearly didn't make it. Brothers and sisters, you and I cannot afford to drag our feet. If we understand the message today, we should not necessarily be living in large cities unless the Lord has directed us to still be there. If the Lord has told us that we have a work to do in the large cities and he allows us to live there, then that is between you and God. No one should judge you for it. But you better know it is really the Lord told you to be there, not your selfish pursuit after the things of this world. If that is the case, you need to flee. You need to make that first phase of fleeing a reality in your life and move out of, the, out of that large city into a smaller city. Because at the time when the Sunday law is enforced here in the United States, when it, the first phase of the enforcement takes place, all the true saints will either be in the small cities or those that are still there because God may have permitted them or directed them to be there for the benefit of certain people. They are no longer going to stay around because they are going to obey the sign. They will understand the sign. And they will obey it and they too will flee to the smaller cities in preparation for the latter rain. So that they can give the loud cry before the end comes. We've got to give that event of AD 70 careful study and consideration because it was indeed a warning. The sign the establishing of those idolatrous standards was a sign that could not have been ignored and you and I cannot ignore the sign of the enforcement of the Sunday law in this country when it happens. Do not do it, brothers and sisters. Do not ignore it. And those of us who know of it in advance, we need to start making our way out of the large cities unless the Lord tells us to stay for a reason that is not self-originated or self-centered. It has to be God and we have to be absolutely sure it is God and not we ourselves that has us there. Or else, at the last minute, like the son-in-laws of Lot, we may not want to leave. We may not want to leave. So before we close, I want us to open our Bibles and read this very interesting set of verses found in Psalms 143, Psalms 143 and verse 8 and 9. Psalm 143 
and look at verse 8 and 9. Hear what the psalmist David declared. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. For I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. I flee unto thee to hide me. This is where we need to be fleeing right now. Before we make that flight to the smaller cities or in preparation for the mountains. We need to flee to the Lord because we need His guidance. We need His protection. We need to be assured that we know where He's leading us. Each and every one of us need to have a personal experience with the Lord today. Not tomorrow. We need to start today. We need to commune with Him more than we have in the past. The Bible tells us we are supposed to be praying unceasingly. Pray without ceasing, we are told. Enoch understood it. And if we are to do a work similar to Enoch, then we have to have an experience like Enoch. We need to learn to walk with God moment by moment. Not just at certain points in time in the day or in the night. No. Moment by moment Enoch walked with God. We need to develop that desire, that joy of being in his presence all the time and looking to him all the time. Then we can rest assured he will lead us. Notice what the, what, what the psalmist had declared that we need him to guide us in regards to where we should walk. We need to know. And only he could tell us where to walk and when to walk there. And then we can rest assured that he will deliver us. But before he can do that, we need to flee to him. And we need to flee to him now. We know that the Lord is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary today. Listening to the prayers of his children as we call upon him to prepare us, to, to, in, in, to fill us with the indwelling of his Holy Spirit so that we can hear his still small voice and that we can have the power and the strength to follow what we know is right. That doesn't come from human sources. That comes from the Lord alone. We are so thankful that he is of a loving kindness nature. That he's merciful and he is long-suffering. Because then we can rest assured that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Especially in light of the fact that we have troublous times ahead of us. But none of the saints should fear. Because just the same way in which the Lord took care of the Christians in the initial experience of AD 70. That is an example for us because he does not change. And he made sure that all the circumstances were right so that nobody could stop them from fleeing. Why? Because they were obedient to him. And those Christians that were obedient to him, not one of them perished. God will do the same for those who are obedient to him today. So let us abide in Christ, brothers and sisters. Let us flee to him every day. Let us flee to him every day and all during the day for his divine presence and his divine strength so that we can follow him faithfully to the end. It is my prayer that each and every one will really take a hold of this message and have a clear understanding of when to flee. So that you will not be deceived by those who are panicking and who are alarmists and who are not rightly dividing the word of truth 
and may cause some of God's people to miss out on one of the most wonderful experiences we could ever have. And that is following the Lord all the way, step by step, to the point that we could be endowed with His Spirit and work marvelously for Him in educating His children in the world before Jesus returns. God be with you and may He help each and every one of us to be faithful to the end. Mm -hmm.